Welcome everyone to a presentation by EDO on the landmark Rocky Hill case, which was handed down by the Land and Environment Court in early 2019. The decision was officially called Gloucester Resources Limited and Minister for Planning and Groundswell Gloucester 2019 New South Wales Land and Environment Court 7, which means that it was the seventh case handed down by the court in 2019. As you know, we represented Groundswell Gloucester, uh, which is a not-for-profit community group concerned with environmental, social and economic issues in your valley. And as you know, the area uh, has traditionally been farming country, primarily beef and dairy, and it's surrounded by exceptional scenic beauty including the World Heritage listed Barrington Tops National Park. Key industries now include agriculture, agritourism and tourism, including ecotourism and accommodation such as farm stays, bed and breakfasts and hotels and motels are increasingly part of the industry in Gloucester and the economy. And the area uh, now is looking towards a more clean and green image, increasingly attracting tourists from around the region and around Australia. Many of you are very aware of the details of the Rocky Hill Coal Project, but just a brief introduction. So Gloucester Resources Limited proposed to establish an open cut coal mine on a greenfield site about three kilometres from the township. And the site was 832 hectares, with 500 hectares of those to be disturbed by mining. There were proposed to be three contiguous open cut pits. Long term amenity barriers, which were up to 40 metres high, were proposed to screen the mine pit from neighbouring properties and the mine was proposed to be developed, operated and rehabilitated over 21 years, of which 16 years were going to be active mining. Uh, in that time, it was proposed to remove about 2 million tonnes of coking coal per year. The Stratford mine, as you know, uh, is located south of the Rocky Hill site. And as part of the development application for the Rocky Hill Coal Project, there was proposed to be an associated modification to the Stratford mine to process and transport the coal from Rocky Hill. And during the proceedings, it was agreed between the parties that this modification was dependent on the Rocky Hill approval. In 2012, the company uh, lodged an initial state significant development application that was amended in 2016 following negotiations between uh, Gloucester Resources and Stratford uh, Coal Proprietary Limited for the use of the Stratford mine as an associated facility to the Rocky Hill Coal Mine. And then in 2017, uh, the department recommended that the then Planning Assessment Commission, which is now the IPC, the Independent Planning Commission, refused the project. Uh, later that month, the PAC held a public meeting, and importantly with a public meeting that preserves merit appeal rights, both on behalf of the proponent and objectors to state significant development. In uh, 2017, the PAC refused the project, uh, citing, in, in, citing incompatible zoning uses, unacceptable visual impact, and the project not being in the public interest. And then in December 2017, uh, Gloucester Resources lodged a Class 1 merits appeal in the Land and Environment Court against the PAC's refusal of the mine. In April last year, our client Groundswell Gloucester applied to join the proceedings as a party or in the alternative to be heard in the proceedings. Our client wanted to be 
joined as a party in the first instance so that it could bring evidence to the proceedings and it could call and cross-examine witnesses. Now, joinder is available where a relevant issue wouldn't be sufficiently addressed unless an additional party is joined to address that issue, or if it's in the interest of justice, or in the public interest for the party to be joined. Our client raised two issues that it said wouldn't be otherwise sufficiently addressed. Firstly, the unacceptable social impacts on the residents and community of Gloucester. And secondly, the impact of the development on greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, as you can see at paragraph 31 of that joinder application decision, the court senior commissioner Dixon said that GRL submits that the raising of the climate issue as proposed in a domestic court, if the intervener, our client, were joined, would not serve the purpose of improving this particular planning decision and instead would be a sideshow and a distraction. I do not agree. So Senior Commissioner Dixon decided uh, that it was uh, in uh, the public interest for our client to be joined, that the issues of social impact and the impact on greenhouse gas emissions wouldn't otherwise be sufficiently addressed. And thankfully, our client was successful in joining the proceedings. The matter was set down in August last year for a two and a half week hearing, and the parties had experts on noise, social impact, planning, uh, economics and climate change. And the key issues in dispute were the compatibility of the mine with the existing approved and likely preferred uses uh, of land in the vicinity, the visual impacts of the mine, the social impacts of the mine, including social impacts caused by noise, dust and visual impacts, the economic and public benefits of the mine versus the public costs of the mine, and whether the mine was in the public interest uh, given those adverse impacts and the direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions and contribution to climate change. The court uh, decided that the mine would be in the wrong place at the wrong time, as Chief Judge Preston so pithily put. So his decision can be divided into two parts, the wrong place factors and also the wrong time factor. Firstly, we'll go through the wrong place factors and then Megan uh, will go through much of the climate change factor. But as you can see, the wrong place factors include planning, amenity, visual, social and economic. And the wrong time factor is climate change. The Minister's principal contention for why the project should be refused was the incompatibility of the mine with other land uses in the project's vicinity, so effectively a planning ground. Now, the Minister was the first respondent in these proceedings, effectively defending the decision of the PAC to refuse consent to the project. And the most relevant environmental planning instrument in this case was the State Environmental Planning Policy, Mining, Petroleum Production and Extractive Industries 2009, otherwise known as the Mining SEP. And as you can see, Clause 12 of the Mining SEP states that before determining an application for consent for a mining development, the consent authority, uh, being the PAC and subsequently the court, standing in the shoes of the PAC as an appeal body, as a merits appeal body, must consider the existing uses and approved uses of land in the vicinity, whether or not the development is likely to have a significant impact on the uses that are likely to be the preferred uses of the land, having regard to land use trends, any ways in which the development may be incompatible with any of these uses, evaluate and compare the respective public benefits and evaluate and measures 
proposed by the applicant to avoid or minimise any incompatibility. So this clause formed the basis of the decision. And it's important to note that planning, the planning ground uh, formed the foundation of many of the other grounds in this decision. What was really interesting from a planning perspective is that the minister's planning expert, Mr. Derrick, talked about the historical progression in the planning instruments applying to Gloucester. In particular, the Gloucester Local Environmental Plan, or LEP, changed over time. So in 1984, the Gloucester LEP had as one of its objectives the provision for the orderly expansion of urban development arising from mining projects. Then in 2000, that changed to protecting rural land. And then more recently, in 2010, that changed to the promotion of principles of ecologically sustainable development, ESD, conservation of biological diversity, and recognition of the cumulative impacts of climate change. So that showed that the local authority, at the time being lost to Shire Council, had changed the planning framework applying to the Gloucester area. And that was very relevant to the land use patterns that would apply to any development in Gloucester, including the proposed Rocky Hill Mine. So Chief Judge Preston found that due to the proposed mine's visual, amenity and social impacts, which we'll get to later, the project would have a significant impact on the likely preferred uses in the vicinity of the development. And the project was incompatible with those existing approved and likely preferred uses. And that the company's proposed measures for mitigation would not avoid or minimize those incompatibilities. The Chief Judge further found that the project's public benefits would not outweigh the project's public costs, nor the public benefits of the existing approved and likely uses. So that was how the court incorporated concerns about visual, amenity and social impacts into the decision via the planning ground, finding that overall those impacts had a significant impact on the community and also were incompatible with those existing approved and likely uses. So turning to visual, and the judge said that the visual impacts, both by themselves and by reason of adverse effects on other current and future land uses, and the social impacts they will likely cause, justify refusal of the project. The minister's other main contention, apart from planning, was visual. And the minister's contention was that the residual visual impact of the project would be significant throughout all stages of the project. Mr Moyer, the minister's visual expert, said that the landscape within the project's visual catchment was of high visual quality and had high landscape values, and that the land uses in the vicinity had high sensitivity to the changes proposed by the project. There would be dynamic visual impacts for travellers travelling north to Gloucester by either road or rail. And further, uh, he said that there was a considerable risk of total or localised values of the vegetation on the proposed amenity barriers that were proposed to shield the project from view. The Chief Judge accepted the Minister's experts' evidence and determined that the project would have a high visual impact incompatible with land uses. The Court also drew attention to the proposed large amenity barriers 
in the even more massive permanent overburden emplacements, which would look out of place in the existing landscape. So the court found that the visual impacts of the project would be high, and the visual impact would be experienced from multiple viewpoints on private and public land, and significantly affect the residential amenity, use, and enjoyment of those properties. The court found that the, that the amenity barrier would appear as a continuous exposed face, more akin to a man-made levee bank following a river uh, than a natural foot slope of the nearby mountain range, and that those amenity barriers would appear incongruous in the existing landscape. The lighting impacts of the project would also be intrusive, the court found, for residents in the vicinity and would materially reduce the visual amenity of the residents. Significantly, the court also accepted evidence about the cultural significance of the landscape to Aboriginal people. And the court heard from Aboriginal uh, laypersons at the site visit as to the cultural value of the surrounding mountain ranges, uh, their importance to the Aboriginal people, and the incredible uh, sites and spiritual significance of that landscape. In terms of amenity, the minister and our client contended that the project's noise and dust impacts would cause a diminution of amenity and therefore social impacts on the community. Mr Gould, uh, our client's noise expert, acknowledged that the project's predicted noise levels would comply with the relevant development standard. However, he said that the emergence of the project's noise from the low measured background noise levels would be likely to cause an unacceptable noise impact and therefore adverse social impacts for nearby residents. The Chief Judge accepted Mr Gould's evidence and found that consideration of the social impacts of the mines intrusiveness noise levels and cumulative amenity noise levels was not precluded by the non-discretionary standards in the mining SEP and nor was consideration of the social impacts of noise precluded by the project's compliance with the noise policy for industry. Now, this is important because effectively the court found that these technical standards, as much as they do apply to the development, do not necessarily impact on the social consideration of the intrusiveness of mine noise, particularly when such noise emerges from very low measured background noise levels. And similarly for dust. So in relation to dust, uh, the Chief Judge found that consideration of the social impacts of air quality was not precluded by the project being compliant with the relevant development standard under the mining SEP. The social impact ground was big for our client and our client, with whom the Minister agreed, contended that the project would have a significant social impact on residents and the community of Gloucester, contrary to the public interest and the principles of ESD. Uh, the court determined the project's social impacts using the department's 2017 Social Impact Assessment Guideline, which is a policy document intended to provide direction on assessing the social impacts of state significant resource projects. Dr. Asquand, who was our client social expert, also used the guideline in her analysis. And this case uh, was the first land and environment court case to use the guideline in determining social impacts. So you can see there that there are nine aspects of social impact that are specified in the guideline. Way of life, community, access to and use of infrastructure and facilities, culture, health and well-being, surroundings, uh, 
personal and property rights, decision-making systems and fears and aspirations. So in considering the guideline and assessing the project against these factors, the court found that, among other things, the moderate positive social impact of the mine on local employment and the local economy may be countered by negative social impacts. He found that a large majority of the community oppose the project. The project would severely impact on people's sense of place, resulting in an extreme social risk rating, and that the social risk rating of noise impacts was high. The court found that the company had failed to assess the social impacts of the project on Aboriginal people, and that the potential impacts on health, well-being, and amenity warranted an extreme social risk rating. The court found that most of the articulated fears and aspirations of people who oppose the project are reasonable and have justification in the evidence, and that the project would result in distributive inequity as the benefits of the project would accrue to the current generation, but the disbenefits of the project would burden current and future generations. Uh, ultimately, the court found that the negative social impacts would not be able to be mitigated or managed. What was innovative about the social impact ground is that our client social expert, Dr. Raskland, was able to bring evidence about social anthropological concepts like solastalgia, erotalgia, topophilia and psychoteratic relationships. Now, these concepts were key to explaining the social impact of the proposed mine on the Gloucester community. So solastalgia is not a new concept to the court. And in fact, it was first raised in the uh, Bulga case several years ago about the distress caused by the loss and change of environment in that community. Similarly, for the Gloucester community, Dr. Raskland was able to adduce evidence about the nostalgic effects of the proposed mine on the community. Related to solastalgia are the concepts of erotalgia, topophilia and psychoteratic relationships. And as you can see on the screen, erotalgia is when an, an individual can no longer imagine uh, themselves in a future place. Topophilia is the intense bond between people in place or setting. And psychoteratic relationships are those relationships that are between the biophysical and built environment and human mental and physical health. They all serve to explain the social impact of proposed developments on communities. And Dr. Raskland is a recognized scholar in this field. So in summary, the court found for social that the Rocky Hill Coal Project would cause a variety of negative social impacts, many of which are likely to have a high or extreme social risk rating. The significant net negative social impacts are a justification for refusing consent to the project. So, Grantsville Gloucester put the contention that the project was not in the public interest or consistent with ecologically sustainable development because of its impact on climate change. From a scientific perspective, this contention has three key elements. The first is that to avoid dangerous climate change, temperature increases must be limited to below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and that's articulated in the Paris Agreement. The second element is that a failure to do so is inconsistent with ESD due to the impacts on the environment, including within New South Wales. And thirdly, that at the current time and under the current policy framework, approving the Rocky Hill Coal Project was inconsistent with avoiding this environmental harm. To assist the court with this contention, Brownsville Gloucester engaged two experts. The first was Professor Will Steffen, who is a climate change expert and researcher at the Australian National University. He's worked as a science advisor to the Australian and ACT governments and is currently a climate counsellor with the Climate Institute. The second expert was Mr Tim Buckley, 
a financial analyst with over 30 years experience, including a decade focused on the international energy sector. GRL also engaged two experts in reply. Dr Brian Fisher is an economist specialising in Australian agricultural, minerals and energy commodities. Dr Fisher has worked on the socio-economic assessment of climate change for various IPCC assessment reports. Dr Fisher was engaged in response to Professor Stephan's evidence. Mr Paul Manley is a Director of Metals and Mining Consulting at Wood Mackenzie, a role which includes coal price forecasting, cost analysis and market advice. This slide is a summary of Professor Stephan's advice to the court. Professor Stephan's evidence went primarily to the first two of the key scientific components of Groundswell Gloucester's contentions, namely that to avoid dangerous climate change, temperature increases must be limited to below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and that a failure to do so was inconsistent with ESD. A key part of this evidence was the need to stay within a carbon budget to avoid dangerous climate change. Importantly, the climate change science that Professor Stephan presented to the court was not challenged by GRL or any of the other parties and the experts agreed that countries around the world need to take significant action to achieve a carbon budget that avoids dangerous climate change. Instead, Dr Fisher's evidence focused on the lack of guidance in international agreements on how emissions reductions should occur and submitted that planned emissions reductions should be viewed through a socio-economic lens. Dr Fisher also took a somewhat different approach to the carbon budget, which sought to enhance the role of carbon sinks. So what is the carbon budget and why was it important in this case? The carbon budget relies on the well-proven relationship between the cumulative anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases and the increase in global average surface temperatures. In court, Professor Stefan explained that the IPCC calculates projected CO2 emissions using four different emission pathways and then uses those pathways and earth system science to model what the temperature would be for any given human emission of carbon dioxide. This allows a scientific determination of the amount of CO2 that can be released into the atmosphere while ensuring that we stay within two degrees warming. This amount is the carbon budget. As far as we are aware, this is the first time that the concept of the carbon budget has been used to discuss the issue of climate change in the court. In evidence, the experts agreed that in one sense, the carbon budget is a best case scenario because it doesn't include things like methane emissions or climate feedback loops, which will take up some of the budget. The budget also depends on what is considered an acceptable probability of achieving the budget. Professor Stephan's evidence was that the carbon budget he discussed was based on the IPCC research that used a 66% probability of limiting global average temperature rise to no more than 2 degrees Celsius. The experts differed in the extent to which they say you can rely on other activities such as carbon sinks or offsets to increase the carbon budget. Professor Stephan explained that in his opinion, you cannot offset emissions from geological sources, such as coal mines, by planting trees, because trees are a part of the active carbon cycle, which exchanges carbon with the atmosphere on a very rapid timescale. If you want to offset emissions from geological sources, you would need to use geological sinks, things like carbon capture and storage, and putting liquefied carbon dioxide down into a geological formation. Professor Stefan said that in the absence of our ability to do this, we shouldn't be relying on carbon sinks to ensure that we remain within the carbon budget. So what does the carbon budget mean for what we should be doing to reduce carbon emissions? Professor Stefan used this graph, originally produced by Figueres in 2017, to show that having decided that the risk of letting the climate system go beyond a two degrees temperature rise is too great, the emissions reductions that you need to achieve to have a reasonable probability of meeting the carbon budget becomes a scientific question. This graph uses a two-third probability of limiting warming to two degrees. What it shows is that there is a very limited amount of fossil fuel that you can continue to use if you want to achieve the target, and importantly, that the longer you leave the response, the more difficult the task of achieving the target will become. The carbon budget is generally calculated from 1870, and we have been drawing down the budget ever since. As of 2017, 
the remaining carbon budget was 250 gigatons of carbon. Based on the current rate of human emissions of CO2 of about 10 gigatons of carbon per year, as of 2017, the world had 21 to 22 years of emissions remaining before the world's economy has to reach net zero emissions. Professor Stephan's evidence was that to meet a carbon budget consistent with not exceeding two degrees warming, a very rapid phase out of all fossil fuel usage by 2050 at the latest or preferably earlier is required. According to Figueres, delaying the peak just a further five years would create a subsequent emission reduction trajectory that would be impossible to follow, both economically and technologically. The experts agreed on the need for a rapid reduction in carbon emissions, but disagreed on the methods by which this should be achieved. It was when we started talking about responsibility for emissions that the difference in the experts' opinion became clear. And the differences are really indicative of many of the discussions we hear about climate change in the media and other forums. In many ways, the disagreement between the experts came down to what we should be doing in light of the scientific knowledge that we are currently on a pathway that will lead to temperature increases above two degrees, that is dangerous climate change. Dr. Fisher said that because most coal in Australia will be exported and then burnt overseas, the responsibility for those emissions belongs to the countries that will burn the coal. However, Professor Stefan pointed out that it's all one atmosphere and we have to start thinking about these things more holistically. One of my favourite quotes of his from the, the hearing was that he said, you can't fiddle with the laws of physics, you can't negotiate with them, they're there. Professor Stefan referred to a study by McGlade and e e Eakins sorry, in 2015, which showed that if all of the world's existing fossil fuels were burnt, about 2.5 times more CO2 would be released into the atmosphere than should be allowed if we want to keep warming within two degrees. When the analysis was extended to consider the type of fossil fuels and the region of the origin of those fuels, the authors concluded that over 90% of Australia's existing coal reserves cannot be burnt to be consistent with the two degree target. Another area of disagreement between the experts related to prioritising emissions. Dr Fisher's view was that there needed to be a distinction made between thermal coal, which is used to produce electricity, and coking coal, which is used to produce steel and would largely be produced by the Rocky Hill coal mine. Dr Fisher said that you need to apply socio-economic considerations to abatement, and that in his view, coking coal would not be the place you would start reducing emissions. Professor Stefan didn't disagree with the concept of applying socio-economic considerations, but emphasised that you can only do this in an environment where you are not increasing emissions. His view was that there are already sufficient fossil fuel projects approved that if fully utilised would exceed two degrees warming, and that must be the starting point in considering new projects. Importantly, Professor Stefan's evidence also explained why these weren't simply global theoretical conversations, but are relevant to decision making today. Using research published by the IPCC and the CSIRO and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, Professor Stefan described to the court the already observed impacts of climate change at a global, national, state and regional scale. He also discussed projected future impacts under different emissions scenarios and explained that the current commitments to reduce carbon emissions have the world on track for three to four degrees warming, and that if every country followed Australia's level of committed action, the world would remain on a trajectory to reach three to four degrees temperature rise by 2100. Professor Stefan also opined that Australia is not on track to meet its 2030 target, and Australia's emissions had risen over the previous three years. Professor Stefan gave evidence that on the current emissions trajectories, there is a high to very high confidence that the mid New South Wales North Coast region and adjacent inland areas, that is the area where the Rocky Hill Coal Project was proposed, will continue to see increased average temperatures with more hot days and warm spells, increased intensity of extreme rainfall events and a harsher fire weather climate. Decreases in winter rainfall are also projected for the region with medium confidence. So Professor Stefan concluded that Australia's existing fossil fuel industries must be phased out as quickly as possible 
with most of the Australian fossil fuel reserves and nearly all of Australia's coal reserves left in the ground. Development of new fossil fuel reserves, no matter how small, is incompatible with any carbon budget, assuming a 50% or better chance of the budget meeting the Paris Agreement. Based on this analysis, Professor Stephen's view was that approval of the Rocky Hill coal mine is inconsistent with the carbon budget approach towards climate stabilisation. Having heard the climate change evidence, the court also heard from Mr Buckley, whose evidence went primarily to the third key component of Groundswell Gloucester's contention, namely that at the current time, under the current policy framework, approving the Rocky Hill Coal Project was inconsistent with avoiding dangerous climate change. Mr Buckley's evidence was that the international modelling of coal requirements based on achieving the Paris targets suggests that the coal from this project was not needed both from a climate perspective and from a technology perspective. That is, the fact that it was coking coal did not make it somehow special, and there are alternative technologies available that could be used to produce steel. An important part of his assumptions was that the world would meet its commitment under the Paris target. This would lead to changes in policy, including mechanisms such as a price on carbon, and those mechanisms would drive the rapid take up of alternative technologies for steel production. These technologies currently exist at commercial scales, even though they haven't been widely implemented. In contrast, Mr Manley's evidence suggested that the nature of this particular coal made it appropriate to approve the project. He argued that there was rising demand for coking coal and that the demand would continue many years into the future. However, it became clear during the expert evidence that the assumptions underlying this position were not consistent with limiting global warming to two degrees. So that's a brief summary of the expert evidence that was presented to the court. I'm now going to hand back to Matt to discuss how the court dealt with that evidence. GRL made four main submissions against the climate change contention and we'll deal with each of those four. So firstly, uh, the company contended that the carbon budget would not necessarily be exceeded because reductions in emissions or increases in the removal of greenhouse gas emissions by sinks could net out the impact of the project. Now, the court rejected this argument, finding that there was no evidence of any specific action to net out the project's specific emissions. And the Chief Judge pithily states that a consent authority cannot rationally approve a development that is likely to have some identified environmental impact on the theoretical possibility that the environmental impact will be mitigated or offset by some unspecified and uncertain action at some unspecified and uncertain time in the future. So that uh, brings the focus of the consent authority to the development as it stands before it, rather than looking at theoretical possibilities uh, at some point in the future. The second argument that the company put forward was that refusing approval to individual coal mines, such as the project would not achieve least cost abatement. Now, the court rejected this argument, uh, stating that if a consent authority determined that a development was unacceptable because of impacts on climate change, it would not be rational to nevertheless approve the development because greater emissions reductions could be achieved from other sources at lower cost by other persons or bodies. So in this sense, uh, the court found that the project would have to be assessed on its merits and the court was not setting policy as a government would uh, for least cost abatement. Rather, the court was focused on a particular development and finding that it would not be rational to approve the development because there could be other emissions reductions achieved elsewhere. Uh, at least cost. The third argument put forward by GRL was perhaps the most important, and it's an argument that's been put in uh, 
quite a few other cases in Australia and around the world. And in Australia, particularly in Queensland, uh, in the land court up there. And that was that the project's GHG emissions would occur regardless of whether the project was approved. And there were two aspects to this argument. And the first was uh, the so-called market substitution or drug dealers defense. And the second was the carbon leakage argument. So the first argument, the market substitution argument, was that coal, particularly coke and coal, would be sourced elsewhere because of its limited substitutes, resulting in at least the same amount of emissions. And the court rejected that argument and said that there was no certainty that that would occur as countries are increasingly acting to combat climate change and air pollution. Further, there was no evidence about the existence and effect of market forces on substitutability. And lastly, the argument was illogical. So the chief judge said the potential for a hypothetical but uncertain alternative development to cause the same unacceptable environmental impact is not a reason to approve a definite development that will certainly cause the unacceptable environmental impacts. So, as I said before, focusing on this particular development and not using other uh, unspecified alternatives, perhaps in other countries, elsewhere, as excuses for, uh, for approving uh, this particular development. And as to the carbon leakage argument, which was that coal mining could move to countries with less stringent environmental policies, climate change policies, leading to an increase in emissions. The court found that there was no evidence that that would occur and that there were other existing and approved coking coal mines in Australia that could meet current and likely future demand. The final argument put forward by GRL in relation to the GHG emissions of the mine was that the project's emissions were justifiable because the project uh, was a coking and not a thermal coal mine. And the court found that the company had overstated this argument. Uh, the court found that, uh, as I said earlier, current and likely future demand for coking coal can be met by other coking coal mines, uh, both existing and approved in Australia. So the court said that scope three emissions were relevant and they were relevant firstly because they were part of the company's own environmental impact statement and secondly because they were part of the existing statutory and case law framework including uh, a reference to downstream emissions in the mining SEP and the concept of the public interest and the principles of ecologically sustainable development. The court also said that the project's direct and indirect emissions would contribute cumulatively to climate change and found that there was a causal link between the project's emissions and climate change. And crucial to those two findings was the carbon budget, as Megan has discussed. However, the court declined to adopt a blanket rule of no new fossil fuel development and instead evaluated the particular merits of this mining proposal. So when evaluating this particular mining proposal, the court proposed an absolute or relative impact test. The court said that we should consider the fossil fuel development uh, in terms of its impact in absolute terms or relative terms. Now in absolute terms, there may be a proposed development uh, that could lead to a sufficiently large source of emissions that refusal of the development could be seen to make a meaningful contribution to remaining within the carbon budget in achieving the long-term temperature goal. Alternatively, if we consider the fossil fuel development in relative terms, other things being equal, it would be rational to refuse fossil fuel development 
with greater environmental, social and, and economic impacts than fossil fuel developments with lesser environmental, social and economic impacts. So for the Rocky Hill Coal Project, uh, the court did not find that in absolute terms, uh, the impact would, uh, in terms of GHG emissions, necessitate refusal. Rather, uh, the court found that the project demonstrated poor environmental and social performance in relative terms. So although the project was not one of Australia's largest coal mines, it had unacceptable planning, visual and social impacts, and such impacts alone justified refusal. But in the weighing of those relative impacts, the project's impacts on climate change added a further rationale for rejection, particularly considering the urgent need to stay within the carbon budget to abide by global temperature limits. GRL's primary argument in favour of the project was the alleged economic benefit to the community and to the state of New South Wales from royalties, income tax, worker benefits and supply benefits. And the company included in its environmental assessment a cost benefit analysis. Uh, the values in a cost benefit analysis are aggregated and the net present value of the net benefits of the project uh, is determined. The minister argued that the direct benefits of the royalties and the company income tax likely to be paid were significantly overstated and were likely to be much less. Uh, the minister further argued that the costs of the project would be greater than the proponent contended, including because many environmental and social costs had not been quantified in the cost benefit analysis, nor included in the net present value of the project. So the court considered whether the public benefits of the proposed project outweighed its costs to the members of the Gloucester community and whether they outweighed the public benefits of other land uses. As you can see, uh, the court found that the negative impacts in terms of social amenity, visual and planning, at least, outweighed the economic benefits, the purported economic benefits of income tax and royalties and supplier and worker benefits. So weighing all of those factors together in what the court has previously called an intuitive synthesis process, a qualitative process, the Chief Judge found that balancing all relevant matters, the project was contrary to the public interest in that the development application should be determined by refusal of consent. So ultimately the court found that the project was in the wrong place and at the wrong time. And GRL declined to appeal the decision. Where to from here? Well, the decision is persuasive authority, uh, although it's not binding because it's a, a merits appeal. But as persuasive authority, we expect the Rocky Hill decision to be highly influential in future decision making for future fossil fuel applications, both in Australia and abroad. EDO New South Wales would like to thank our client Groundswell Gloucester on a magnificent effort in these proceedings. Although the community has been through ups and downs over the past a decade or more, uh, we have reached this wonderful decision that will hopefully be a beacon uh, to individuals and communities, not only here uh, in our state, but around the country and hopefully internationally.